Welcome to Green Gotham. I'm Lou Blaustein. Thanks for watching. When people think of climate change, often they think its effects are going to be felt by the next generation, or the generation after that, or maybe the generation after that, which is an excuse not to do anything. Well, our guests have experienced the effects of climate change up close and personal in real time in Antarctica. Joining us are Dina Seidel, producer and director of the stunning and must-see documentary Antarctic Edge 70 Degrees South, and Nicole Waite, a research scientist who has worked down in Antarctica with an organization called Are You Cool? Dina, Nicole, welcome to Hi. Green Gotham. Thank you for being here. having us. And before we show the trailer to the film, Nicole, what is Are You Cool? Are You Cool is a part of the Marine Science Department at Rutgers University, and it stands for um, Rutgers University Center of Ocean Observing Leadership. I like Are You Cool better. <laughs> and Dina, Nicole, we're going to now show mm -hmm. our viewers this stunning documentary, at least a trailer from it. So roll the trailer. sea level disaster facing us. It's a hard job. It's 24-7. It is an extreme environment. It's a very harsh place to work. It's a very dangerous place to work. The big danger is that you get trapped in the ice. On one of my first cruises, we ended up being stuck in the ice for an entire month. This is about science. We're right at the heart of some of the largest climate change on Earth. We're right there at ground zero. In my lifetime, that whole area of Earth has changed. The winter sea ice season is 90 days shorter. They likely won't make it through the first winter. And there is a complete sense of responsibility. We can't mess this up. I'm not sure we're going to make it. Dina, I said stunning, that's also compelling and must-see. So congratulations Thank on you. a great film. Thank you. So there's so many angles to go here, but what I'm going to start with is what was it like to be in the Antarctic environment to make this film, and how long were you there? Well, I was there for six weeks, and it was a very unusual shoot, <laughs> to say the least. Not like the studio here, mm. you mean? No, no, <laughs> not at all. Uh, there was just so much happening so fast. Most of the time, almost all six weeks, I spent on a research vessel, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, uh, the Lawrence Gould. And um, with these uh, scientists that are part of the National Science Foundation's long-term ecological research project, studying the changing ecosystem along the Western Arctic Peninsula. So what was it like? I was on a small quarters in a research vessel. The two-person shoot, it was me and Chris Linder, who's an amazing ice photographer, uh, generally a still photographer. So making a, a big movie like this was new to him. But of course, being in Antarctica was new to me. He had all this science training in Antarctica. And he is a scientist. So um, that was a really special match for this film because I knew about feature films and storytelling. But then again, we're on a boat and we're using small cameras. Um, and it's in Antarctica, so, so you know, you're, you can't go to B&H if, if a camera breaks, you're sort of on Mars. What was it like? It was exciting, thrilling, otherworldly, um, scary sometimes, uh, exhausting, lonely. I mean, it was a lot of things. It was everything. It, it was really sounds like hard. it was life changing. It was life changing. That's it. <laughs> That was that. Totally See, that's life how they pay me yeah. the big bucks. Thank you. you <laughs> yes, you focused me. It was totally life changing. There's no doubt about it. But I was. Uh, I would say that the thing I was most afraid of when I was there was not. My, my fear was that I wasn't going to have enough material to make a feature film when I got back. And also, my learning curve for the science was was so rapid. In fact, a lot of the science I figured out later when I was going through the footage, as much as I'd read about the science, as much as I'd spoken with the scientists, as much, as, as much research as I'd done, 
they're at such a high level. They're so they're they're top of the world scientists and. And it, they're really studying a changing ecosystem, so they're looking at different parts of the ecosystem. And they're, they're doing it 24-7, so two cameras, right? How are we filming <laughs> everything? And we came back with 400 hours of footage. And what I'd like to share about this project, which is, was really special, is the National Science Foundation gave us this grant. Which is very unusual. For, for university and for Rutgers in, in particular. Yeah, you sort of cut me off there, man. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I also I had to get in the Rutgers thing because I'm a Rutgers Yeah, brand. yeah, absolutely. So, so, right, so Oscar and I, uh, at the time, I was the director of the Rutgers Center for Digital Filmmaking, um, and he and I had made a, a film with um, Scott Glenn in our marine science department at Rutgers uh, called Atlantic Crossing, and based on the success of that film, um, we applied for a grant for the National Science Foundation because I found out about Oscar's really amazing, amazing research in Antarctica, studying phytoplankton as part of this long-term ecological research team, right, for the National Science Foundation. So we wrote a grant together, and it was called Connecting Research to Public Audiences. And it wasn't just for the, the making of a film. It was really for the basis of an educational model, and it had to involve students. So it was we bringing back all the footage, uh, my job was then to work with my undergraduates in, in my film center to shape the film and to also study how they were learning science through the process of narrative filmmaking. So it, it really had all of these components to it. Um, and at the same time, I'm, I'm still responsible for having enough material to make a feature film. And we're shooting, Chris Linder is shooting with a, a, a Nikon primarily, and I'm shooting with a FS700. Um, these are not, you know, these are not big cameras, um, and we're, you know, having to convert all the footage onto the drives there. Um, there's big waves. There's, you know, you're getting seasick. Which you saw right, you saw the waves right at the beginning of that trailer, yeah, and that yeah. just draws you right in. I, I saw the film uh, at a screening in the spring in New York, and again, as a proud Rutgers alum, I was so thrilled to see something of that quality from my alma mater, but I also was, you know, just as a, as a, as a, someone who enjoys documentary films, mm -hmm. I was brought, drawn in right away for, what is it, 75 minutes. It, you just don't take your eyes off of it. And then also, as someone who is steeped in climate change to the, to, not at the level of the uber scientist, but I found the, I learned stuff. Cool. And yeah. so, to Nicole, you, you are down in Palmer Station, which is Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And while you didn't work on the film, you're working on the same research that was in the film that Dina just cited. So maybe you could talk about what your work is like down there and what you're working on at Palmer Station. Yeah, um, I work with Oscar Schofield, as Dina mentioned, at Rutgers, and we are the phytoplankton component, which the phytoplankton are the small plants that are the base of the food web um, in the ocean, kind of like you know grass might be the base of a food web on land. The phytoplankton are really important, and we work as a, a broader or in the broader long-term ecological research project down in Antarctica, um, which has two components: the Palmer Station component, which is a long-term um, spring and uh, Antarctic spring and summer. So, and, and Palmer Station is where? Just it's on the western Antarctic Peninsula um, on an island called Anvers Island. And that's where the Lawrence Gould comes into port, and then they go on their research cruise that Dina filmed um, up and down the whole peninsula. So there's our two parts to our, um, our climate work where we can look at in one location and look for many years. Our, uh, I think it's the 25th year of the um, long-term ecological research project uh, at Palmer Station, um, and we're at the peninsula, and we can look at one location and how it has changed over time with climate change. Um, and we can also look at the north and south along the peninsula, um, how it changes in different locations over the years as well. Well, what the film made clear to me and was highlighted in the trailer that it's ground zero for the effects of climate change is the rapidity with which the environment has changed um, in terms of temperature rise, uh, higher than average down in Antarctica over the last 50 years. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Right. So, so Oscar Schofield is our main scientist through the film, and um, he says in the film that that 
temperatures along the Western Arctic Peninsula have risen by 11 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 50 years. What's interesting about this scientific uh, research and this, this study that they do every year for six weeks is um, they, 30 years ago, uh, when they were really starting to do this, uh, this collected data that is now part of this long-term ecological research, they had no idea about climate change. It was, so the National Science Foundation has these long-term studies around the world. There's only two in Antarctica, and this is the only one along the peninsula, which is the fastest winter warming place on Earth. So when they went down there, there wasn't because of climate change That's correct. originally. It was just to study an, a, a sea ice ecosystem. And then the sea ice started going go away. Away. And around Palmer Station, what they what they noticed most most obviously was the decline in the Adelie penguin population. Um, and the penguins, the Adelie penguins around Palmer Station have declined now by 85, almost 90 yeah. percent over the yeah. last 25, 30 years, I yeah. guess, since um, the Frasers have been looking yeah. at it. And and the the penguins really become a theme through our film um, because we go to, or the, the scientists, the crews goes to Three different islands, and they're they're really panting and 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 not well and dying along Palmer Station. We go uh, midway along the peninsula, and we stop at, at Avian Island, where the scientists stay for five days and do a real census and, and count them. Um, and they're 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 thriving there. And then the 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 rest of the story is trying to get Char to Sharko Island, which is very hard to get to. It's sort of a uh, just a, a rock face, a precipice yeah. that that uh, the penguins are just sort of hanging on. Um, but it's colder there, and it's sort of it, it becomes for the scientist an example of what Antarctica used to be like. I had been working with Oscar uh, uh, and 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 Scott Glenn on this uh, with my students on on this feature film and uh, Atlantic Crossing because they're this incredible team of scientists and they had navigated this autonomous robot across the Atlantic uh, successfully. There was only a five percent chance. Uh, I filmed with them for two years, and the film screened in the Smithsonian. It was a big success. Um, so then. Again, I asked Oscar, uh, because I learned while I was making that film, that he was sending these glider robots mm -hmm. that are very, um, sort of a, a big part of the science in, 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 at Rutgers in terms of the marine science community. He sends them to Antarctica, and he was doing research in Antarctica, so I was asking him about that. And the more he was telling me, and the more I saw photos and footage, I thought, this was just incredible. This is amazing. I was like, is there any way we can do this story? Because these glider robots transmit reams and reams of important data Correct, about yeah. climate and other things. Well, it, it, it's data about the ocean, right, which it then allows them to model it and really see the effects of climate change, right? So they're looking, uh, right, it, it's temperature, salinity, it can also be phytoplankton blooms. Yeah, there's different sensors we can put on. We can track um, oxygen, mm -hmm. which can change with temperature changes in the water. We can look at phytoplankton communities and right. um, when we go out as scientists and we take a sample, a water sample. We can't do that everywhere. We have, we're limited to the number of bottles we have, or you know, where we can get the boat. But um, we can send these gliders or the autonomous vehicles out, and they can collect a lot more data and cover a lot more ground than we can. So I think one of the really important messages with regard to climate change in our film is that the ocean is a, a driver. Mm -hmm. of the worth uh, of the earth's climate and i don't know that a lot of people realize that but the ocean is absorbing what is it 90 percent of the sun's rays that's right. right so that's taking in all the heat and then the the circulation system of of the ocean the global ocean co uh, currents yeah. is driving our weather and and so um so what, what's going on it's all on, connected it's all from connected. the phytoplankton to the to the penguins to but basically from the way the chemistry of the water is changing of the oceans is changing due to due to the carbon that has been emitted. That's affecting everything. Yeah, that's correct. Everything is interconnected, and, and the Southern Ocean around Antarctica is is a big um, driver of the Earth's ocean circulation system. And so the changes there um, are very important. And, and again, heat affects currents and, and duration of currents and speed of currents, and all these things are are, are happy. It's very 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 complicated. So going back to why why are the gliders so important and why is Oscar's work and, and the work that's going on at, at Marine Science at, at Rutgers so incredibly important is that is that the ocean is huge and the change is rapid and how can you collect data about something so large, right? And and going out on ships and sampling as you see in the in the movie <laughs> 
is, um, you know, as Oscar says in the film, it's like uh, trying to sample this giant ocean with a fancy bucket, right? right? Yeah. But the, the glider robots um, are, are much less expensive. Uh, they don't harm any people, right? No, nobody's at sea in, in, in danger. Um, because being at, at, at sea is always dangerous and it's a uh, hundred times more data is coming back if not if not more yeah. than it's a, it's just an it's true yeah, it's, it's something up there like it's that, tremendous yeah. <laughs> amount of, of data uh, that's allowing them to then put all that data into a model and really understand how how our oceans are changing so going back to how did we think of, of uh, of um, going to Antarctica, I know his his science was important, uh, but it took really a, a whole team to write this grant because it, it was it was the I, I was at the art school uh, directing a film program. I had the success of Atlanta Crossing. Uh, we needed to get all the scientists that are part of the long term ecological research mm -hmm. project featured in the film to sign on and agree to trust me to tell this story. But that had to be a relationship of trust that was. Uh, established through Oscar and and that's relationships of trust are key to making documentaries because you're living with these people especially cross departmental where you're going from the world of the arts to the world of the sciences and so I'll turn to the scientist yeah. um, you know as you're looking at the film and looking at the artists that mm -hmm. made it you know what's your point of view of looking at the film from the scientist's point of view um, I think that the film does a really good job at portraying the message and one thing that I personally find as important for um, as a scientist we want to get our what we're doing out there and we want um, people to be able to access the research in ways that they can understand and one thing about Dina's documentary is it's really good at that message and when you bring people and you show them Antarctica um, and you show them what's happening it is kind of one of those things that it actually um, resonates with people, and they uh, and it resonates with me just seeing it. You know, it brings me out of the sampling. Okay, I'm going to take my water sample. I'm going to analyze, study what's going on, and it lets me see the bigger picture as well um, in a way that then I can take my work and maybe talk to you know you or my grandma or something about it. Um, and it's just a really good way of doing that. Well, also I think in watching the film, it makes the scientists rock stars and <laughs> that's very important and yes. <laughs> I think that that is important and again there, to bring up Oscar I saw a TED talk that mm -hmm. you and Oscar uh, co kind of did and uh, in it he's talking about hey the scientists have the coolest job in the world they are adventurers they're out in the world they're discovering stuff but they're seen as kind of the nerds mm -hmm. and so how did so do you think that science is cool, and does this make it feel a little cooler? Oh, I totally think science is cool. Um, yeah, when you get to go places and you get to tell your, you know, your uncle or your little cousin, oh, yeah, I just went to Antarctica. I'm a scientist. I'm studying climate change and phytoplankton and all of these really important things in the world. Um, it may, everybody thinks it's really cool. Everybody I've talked to, I don't think I've talked to one person that were like, oh, you went to Antarctica. That's kind of lame. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it's so. Pretty cool. But what would be interesting to know, because then, Dina, you're also teaching, as you mentioned, the undergrads mm -hmm. on the film mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. And so they're interacting also with the scientists. That's correct. That, so that's amazing. That's just an so amazing, magical interaction. So my, my students, because we, we evaluate them before and after these types of collaborations, and so many of them, um, because unfortunately our education system is pretty bifurcated in terms of humanities, arts, Science. You choose one or the other, and really STEM that is STEM or not STEM. Right, and it, it really it, it it doesn't allow us to be sort of holistic uh, and and either communicate science or engage with science in a, in a different way. So what we're able to do in our in the film center was was allow through a creative process and product um, and authorship of a creative product to engage in in science and and so my my students so many of my art students said you know I just I'm I don't understand science I'm intimidated by science I'm intimidated by scientists I don't think like a scientist uh, you know I'm not interested in science but then when you when we give them this opportunity to have the responsibility to communicate things that matter and then to engage with the scientists mm -hmm. uh, that it just lifts them up. They feel respected, responsible. They have agency and motivation, and and they they rise to the occasion. And they wind up learning so much in the process. They also wind up using cinematic techniques 
and editing techniques that appeal to their peers. So they wind up being like an artistic translation, translator to, of important topics. Now Antarctica... Um, which helps tell the story. Of course. Which is the ultimate goal. But right. Storytelling of science mm -hmm. is not easy. But this, they made it, and you made it look it's easier. Because we do it as character-driven narratives, and it's about human motivation and why the scientists care and why it's important to them. And that's why the film is not didactic, because it's really told through the scientist's point of view. And, and climate change is, is real, and they're seeing it, so they're ex we're, we're f following their journey. The fact that it isn't you know, uh, narrated as, as, um, in sort of a didactic uh, or dogmatic way uh, we found that the film is much more receptive to a really broad audience, and, and that, that's fantastic. Um, so Antarctica, 14 undergraduates worked on it uh, with the editing, but also the interviewing of the scientists here as well, and um, research, doing a lot of the research. But while I was director, I was able to send our, my students to, um, to Zambia to make their own films, uh, to Brazil. To, they've been to Spain, they've um, traveled around the world with researchers uh, filming themselves and having that sense of, you know, total filmic experience from field production, cinematography, directing, and, and long-term direct engagement with researchers, which has just been uh, transformative for them, for the researchers, and also, I think, just for undergraduate, you know, we call it pedagogy, but undergraduate learning, like, wh what is what are the great new, you know, uh, models for, for teaching? Well, that's... Fantastic. And, and Nicole, what are you, when you're in Palmer, mm -hmm. what are you learning and what are you studying as it relates to phytoplankton specifically? Yeah, um, we are looking at what types of phytoplankton are there, how much phytoplankton is there, um, you know, which is all really important for the whole broader ecosystem if there are phytoplankton A and the, um, the zooplankton or the animal, little animals that eat the phytoplankton, um, which, you know, the penguins will then eat, and it affects everybody. If they don't like the phytoplankton that's there because it's changed, um, then... Or if there's less of or it. Or there's less of it, then it, that, you know, ripples up through the food chain. Um, and so we're looking at types of phytoplankton. Uh, we're also looking at the water qualities um, that might impact the phytoplankton temperature, salinity, big key ones which can be affected from the warming or um, the glaciers melting and putting a, a lot of fresh water into the oceans. We also look at how different light properties are changing in the water column, how they can affect the phytoplankton. Mm. Um, so, and just kind of getting a whole, a whole picture of everything that's going on in this really important key ecosystem. And, and what is life like while you're down there? Because you're down there for... Um, yeah, our research season at Palmer Station is October through uh, March. So that's their summer. That's their, their summer, spring. Spring and summer. Spring so and you summer. were there for four months? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's a small place. There's maximum 45 people at Palmer Station. Um, but, you know, it's, you're doing really cool work and um, you work really hard, but it can be really fun. and. You, there's harsh weather, but... Um, you have movie night? Yeah, we have movie night. Um, you got to see Antarctic Edge? I did, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It's something that I, you know, years ago would never have thought that I would be doing, but it's really important. Um, it's a great place to do research. Um, there's a lot of, you know, NSF. Um, and National Science, Science Foundation. National Science Foundation, yeah. And the community at Palmer really supports all of the science and all the research that we're doing. And there's sunlight, 23 hours a day. Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. that's really that's when I so left interesting. Antarctica yeah. and I got back, I was like, it's dark out. <laughs> what is that? Right, but, it, does, um, it doesn't get dark. Yeah. One thing that a lot of people have asked me, and that is actually really surprising, but what, while you're in Antarctica, again, it's their summer, so it's actually warm. Um, in January, there it's you know 40 degrees Fahrenheit, normally warmer than it is here in New York or New Jersey. Um, but there was no snow. The glacier was still there. It was ice, um, but the rocks right outside the station, there was no snow, and people think, you're in Antarctica, there's no snow? What do you mean there's no snow? Yeah, what's up with that? Um, but, you know, you just see it firsthand, the climate climate change um, and things that are going on. Well, and we're, we're kind of running on time here, but I wanted to ask if either of you saw, while, while you've been down there, any of these, like the ice sheets breaking off that you see. The calving? Yes, yeah. the calving. Yeah. And what's yeah, that, you do, you what's do that see like? 
It's, it's loud. It's very loud. You um, kind of sounds like thunder. Um, but yeah, it happens quite a bit. It does happen quite a bit, right? You'll uh, you'll just chunks see. will fall. Mm -hmm. There's pieces of the glacier will fall off. And yeah. then I'm gonna ask one last question, which is, the reviews that I read of the film were awesome. Were and. But there was one, I'm not even going to say it's a criticism, but there was one comment in one of the reviews that said, you didn't take a point of view on what should be done about this problem. Mm. Could you just talk a little bit about why that decision was made? Well, there's a lot of things that people can do. Um, people can make a lot of, they, they can make personal choices about carbon footprint. They can make, uh, it's a larger policy issue for ways in which people would like to be politically involved. Um, but I think what mattered most for us is that, again, this is a told by the point of view of the scientists, so just allowing people to connect and understand that Antarctica is important, uh, which then affects voters because the voters are the ones who uh, agree to fund the scientific research that's going on there. It's expensive. Um, the film was just uh, purchased by Participant Media and will be on Pivot the Pivot Channel, uh, which is national. And what's exciting about participant media, for those of people who know it, is that all their films, all their documentaries are connected to a social action campaign, or a number of them. And um, I think we do, the film does say, obviously we have to be paying attention to how we're using uh, our carbon footprint and how we're burning fossil fuels and all but of we, that, but there's so many different ways to do it. And, and individual choices matter, but it's the collective voice that's gonna affect policy that really matters. Well. We want that policy to change. We want, we, I'm glad that Participant Media has picked it up and it's also available on Netflix. Thank you so much, Dina, Nicole, for your work and for joining us. And thank you for watching and see you next time on Green Gotham.